Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Great to see you. If you would, please stand as we sing. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I praise you in the morning. I praise you in the morning. I praise you in the evening I praise you when I'm young and when I'm old I praise you when I'm laughing I praise you when I'm grieving I praise you every season of the soul If we could see how much you're worth Your power, your might, your endless love Then surely we would never cease to pray Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens. Praise you in the heavens. Joining with the angels. Praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now. Joining with creation. Calling all the nations to your praise. If they could see how much you're worth. Your power, your might, your endless love. Then surely they would never cease to praise you. Everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I praise you in the morning. I praise you in the morning. I praise you in the evening. I praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. I praise you when I'm laughing. I praise you when I'm grieving. I praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease. everybody. It's so good to see you this morning. Uh, welcome to worship on this Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms here. Uh, before you take a seat, just turn and greet your brother and sister next to you, would you? As you're taking your seat, there's uh, one announcement that we want to lift up to you. Our drama ministry uh, has a production that's going to be coming up very soon. And we have the star of the cast with us today. Mr. Todd Cochran is going to come up and tell us a little bit about it. Thanks, Todd. Good morning. My name is Todd Cochran. I'm, I'm not the star. I've got a little bit role. I play Atticus Van Leer, a, a little Mississippi Southern lawyer. Uh, 
it's center stage. We're putting on this production. It's called Southern Fried Funeral. It's a hysterical uh, comedy uh, with uh, funerals and uh, lawyers and uh, all things like that. So, uh, but we've been enjoying uh, uh, rehearsing for it, and we're all in stitches half the time. So I think you will all really enjoy it. Uh, so. I invite you to come over next door to buy tickets. Uh, they're on sale in the fellowship hall. Get some coffee, some donuts, and buy some tickets. The preview night is May 30th. That's, uh, we have a gala uh, scheduled $35 for couples for a southern funeral food buffet. And then uh, May 31st through June, June 2nd, uh, we have 7.30 performances. That's pay as much as you can. And then June 3rd should be our final uh, matinee performance at 2.30. So come next door, get some tickets, and we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Yeah, so just to make sure you know, Fellowship uh, Central is in our gym, so if you walk out these doors right here and go straight across, that's where Fellowship Central is. So we encourage you to go there and get some tickets for that. Well, I invite you to join me with a word of prayer as we get ready to worship. Lord, we are so, so deeply grateful uh, for the gift of this moment, for the gift of the breath that you just gave us. And we pray, O oh God, that as we settle into this space and this time of worship, that, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, which is present with us, that you would give birth to something new in our lives today. That for those of us who have been stuck in despair, that you might give us a glimmer of light and hope. For those of us who are stuck in doubt, that you might give us a deep sense of assurance of your great love for us. Lord, we pray that as we continue to sing to you, as we open up your scriptures and explore them together, as we come to your table today to commune with you, we give you free reign here among us, and we pray that your spirit would move among us, move our hearts, move our minds into the direction that you want to lead us, and help us to be open to going wherever you want to lead us. We ask these things through Christ our Lord, and let all God's children say, Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from two passages in the book of Isaiah, first from chapter 49, verses 14 and 15. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will never forget you. And from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 12 and 13. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our offering this morning, we come to the time in our service where we give of our tithes and offerings, and I want to let you know about our second mile giving opportunity today. These are um, opportunities that we have in the life of the church to go above and beyond our giving to the operating budget for special ministries and partnerships that Pulaski Heights has um, with different programs. And today we have a really special one. Today we are supporting the uh, prison ministries of PHUMC. Uh, not a lot of people know that PHUMC has three different prison ministries. And these are led not by our pastoral staff, but by lay people. Gwen Eford, Ralph Schull, and Jimmy Faulkner are both, uh, are the three of them, help lead uh, three very important and very different prison ministries. Gwen Eford is in charge of our My Watch program, which is ministry um, to women with, uh, let me get it right, uh, ministries to incarcerated women and their children. So once a month, um, Gwen and her volunteers load up a van filled with children whose mothers are incarcerated, and they give those children once a month the opportunity just to spend the day with, it, with their moms, um, which especially as we're celebrating Mother's Day today, uh, is just a blessing and a joy for those women and for their children. Um, on the second Sunday of each month, members of PHMC offer a Bible study to 120 out of 150 men um, in the prison led by Ralph Scholl. This is an optional uh, ministry every time we come, and yet almost all of the men who are there um, choose to take part in this Bible study. So that's the second of these awesome ministries that we have. Lastly, 10 of our youth and three adults who are dedicated volunteers lead a Bible study uh, for 40 or 50 of 
the youth at the Alexander Youth Prison Facility. Um, we go once a month, we take uh, cookies and punch um, and the Word of God, and Jimmy preaches, and the youth have an opportunity just to sit next to these young men and just speak truth and life into them. Uh, last year, 72 men, um, young men, were baptized or renewed their baptism through the ministry of Pulaski Heights. So that's just a joy to get to celebrate um, young men just turning their life around and coming to Christ. So um, we want to we want to give you these special opportunities. Uh, just if there's a ministry that we highlight throughout the year that really touches your heart, um, we hope that you will support that. So this is one that we feel is very special, and we hope you will uh, give to this offering today. There are uh, envelopes, I think, in every other seat. Um, so if you're interested in giving, we hope that you will do that this morning. And as our ushers come forward to receive our gifts, would you bow with me in prayer? Holy God, we thank you that you are a transforming God, that you are a renewing God, and that you are a God who never lets go, that you are a God who will seek after us and chase after us and never let go. We thank you for the ways in which you have tugged on our heartstrings and called us to be better people, to be your disciples, and be your agents of transformation and change in the world. We pray that we would do that this day through the tithes and offerings that we give to you. We pray that you would take them, that you would bless them, and they would be used for the glory and the furthering of your kingdom, that you, God, would be glorified and exalted. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.
As we get into the message today, uh, I'm, I'm calling today's sermon, The Mother God. And uh, it may be a message that raises some questions for you that you want to ask me about. If so, you can text questions to this number, uh, 501-570-6150. It should be printed on your worship handout uh, if you need to remember it later. And so during the service, if a question comes to mind you want to ask, feel free to text. Um, we'll check it tomorrow morning. So if this afternoon, if you have a question, you can send it in then too. And then what I'll do this week is do a video response and put it up on my blog, uh, which the address is there on the screen. So I look forward to any questions I may get from you on that. I'm going to start off with this question. Is God really a boy? We have young children, and like parents of most young children, we have bedtime rituals. And part of our bedtime ritual, ideally every night we would read a Bible story together and pray and all that warm, good stuff. But in reality, maybe twice a week or so, uh, we get the Bible out and we read a story together and we pray together, uh, and that's our bedtime ritual. And then after that, it's time to go to bed. At least ideally, in practice, it's time to get another drink and so on, things like that. But that's our ritual. And so we usually have time where we just let the girls just ask whatever questions they want to ask about whatever story we might happen to be reading. And a couple years ago, one of our daughters, who was around five at that time, asked this question, is God really a boy? It's an interesting question. You know, when you're five years old, it's natural and normal for you to imagine God as like some superhuman being out there somewhere. That's natural and normal. What's interesting, though, is that in her five-year-old mind, she had picked up this assumption that God is more like a boy than like a girl. And the tone in her question was one of sort of disappointment. <laughs> you know, is God really a boy? Now, it's interesting that she would pick up that assumption. We never told her directly God is a boy. But from being around church, she picked up this idea that God is more like a boy than like a girl. And that concerned me for a couple of different reasons. One of which, just as a personal, you know, as her father, what concerned me the most was this, is that when a little girl thinks that God is a boy, then that little girl is going to grow up to be a woman who in some way feels inferior in relation to men and how they relate to God and how they know God and how they follow God. And I certainly don't want that for my daughters. I don't want that for, for any young woman. Um, her question revealed a very deep assumption uh, that many of us have. You know, for many of us, uh, growing up, we have been taught, conditioned, I think more implicitly than explicitly, to think about God and refer to God in solely masculine terms. What I want us to do today is to think together about maybe how the language we use for God sometimes distorts God and limits God in the way we refer to God, particularly in only referring to God in masculine ways. Now, this doesn't just come from church. This also comes from many aspects of our culture, particularly the art that we are familiar with. Um, in any sort of religious art where God is depicted, and this is one of the most famous examples of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, God is depicted as this old man with a white beard. This is such a popular image, I think, that when you say the word God, the picture that probably comes into most people's mind is that of a man. Apparently this man is very comfortable wearing pink, so I guess that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but this is the image that comes into mind, a very sort of masculine figure. And it's not just in great art, but we can go down to, say, Gary Larson's Far Sides. Um, God is always, seems like, pictured as a man with a gray beard and white hair. What I want us to think about today is perhaps some of our conditioning and the way we think about God doesn't fully align with what the Bible actually reveals about God. So today I want us to examine the full biblical witness for what God is like and see if in perhaps some ways we maybe have gotten off track just a little bit. Now in doing this, the first thing we need to acknowledge is this. Whatever images we use for God, whatever language we use for God, God is always bigger and better than that language. This is just baseline, foundational biblical religion. Even though God is constantly revealing himself throughout the scriptures, there's always this reminder that God remains transcendent and mysterious. Take, for example, the burning bush episode, one of the most foundational, revelatory narratives in the Bible where God appears to Moses and calls Moses to go back to Egypt to set his people free. It says, Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, what's interesting here is God really refuses to answer Moses' question. Moses wants some sort of name so that Moses can kind of categorize God, can pin God down. But God just says, I am who I am. If I could paraphrase this, it's as if Moses says, tell me your name, and and God says, what business is that of yours? I am who I am. And some translations say, I will be who I will be. So it's kind of a sassy response from God here, if you will. He's telling Moses, don't attempt to pin me down in human names and human categories and human thoughts. All throughout the scriptures we see this. Here's another example from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord says through Isaiah, to whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. This, by the way, is a rhetorical question. God has no equal. God has no, there's no created thing that God can literally be likened to. God transcends it all. Notice this uh, interesting passage from 1 Kings chapter 8. This is when King Solomon builds a temple and dedicates it to God. And at the, I guess you would call it the the coronation ceremony or the, the, the consecration ceremony, this is what he prays there. It says, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread out his hand to heaven, and he said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. He goes on to say, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. So Solomon builds this temple as a sign, as a symbol of God's saving presence on earth. But from the very beginning, Solomon acknowledged God can't be contained within these bricks. And as the same way, just as God cannot be contained in temples built by human hands, God cannot be contained in words and images constructed by human minds. God remains transcendent over it all. This is why one of the most important commandments in the Old Testament, the second commandment of the Big Ten, is this. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that's in heaven above or that's on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall make no idols for yourself. Whether those idols be, um, you know, graven images carved out of stone uh, or wood or metal, or whether those images be mental images. God cannot be contained in any one image. This is why the making of idols is wrong. Because what idols do is idols attempt to contain the reality of God in one thing. Perhaps we could put it this way. Images point beyond themselves. Idols contain within themselves. When it comes to our language about God, we have to have images. We have to have metaphors. We have to have analogies. And those are useful and necessary in our walk with God. But what happens sometimes is we might take one particular image and literalize that image, absolutize that image, and then it becomes idolatrous. Anytime an image ceases to point and attempts to contain the reality of God, it becomes an idol. We need many, many images for talking about the reality of God. The biblical authors understood this very well. That's why throughout the scriptures, we find so many different ways of imagining God, of imaging God in the Bible. Uh, Here's a, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just all the things I could think of from my knowledge of scripture. God is sometimes pictured as a shepherd, a father, a mother, redeemer, judge, deliverer, friend, sometimes like a mother bear, a lover, a helper, a warrior, a mother hen, An eagle, a lion, refuge, water, rock, shield, fortress, fire, and light. None of these things, no created thing, contains the reality of God. Then it would become an idol. But all of these things can point towards the reality of God. All of these things can convey something about who God is and what God is like. But out of all the biblical images we have for God, according to the scripture, there is one created thing that images God better than anything else. All of these can be images. And notice these are masculine, these are feminine, these are non-animate, they're they're animals. Anything can image God in some way. But according to the scriptures, there is one created thing that images God best, and that is human beings, male and female. In Genesis 1, 27, one of these foundational texts in the Bible says, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
What this means then is that men and women alike can equally reflect and represent God into the world. This truth has often been lost throughout history, even throughout church history. It's often been the case that we've taken men as imaging God, but we have forgotten that women can image God just as well. In many ways, we have neglected and discarded the many ways the biblical authors use women, and in particular mothers, as an image for who God is and what God is like. So today what I would like for us to do is spend a few moments looking at some of these discarded images, these images that we quickly pass over or perhaps neglect, images that talk about God in feminine and maternal ways. Now, as we go forward, I want you to know this. I'm keenly aware that for many Christians, speaking about God in maternal terms, speaking about God with feminine language, uh, raises lots of objections from some folks. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to address what some of those objections are. But for now, I just want to point out that biblical authors didn't seem to really have the sort of hang-ups that many of us often have. They seemed very comfortable with using both masculine and feminine language for God. That's because they assumed that God transcended gender, that even though God includes masculinity and feminine, femininity, that's a hard word to say, femininity, is that the right way? Femininity. Excellent. You try saying that. That's tough. It's a tough one. Even though God includes those, God transcends those as well. So what we sometimes find is biblical authors use masculine and feminine language in the very same sentence in referring to God, which reveals they really didn't have much hang-ups with this. Notice what Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 18. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. What I find fascinating about this verse is that Moses uses three different images for God in one sentence. He refers to God as a rock, he refers to God as a father, and he refers to God as a mother. This seems to reveal that you know, Moses didn't take any of these images literally. They all metaphorically said something powerful about who God is. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Moses was very comfortable using both maternal uh, and, and, and father image alike in the same sentence. Just a couple more examples of this. Uh, in Isaiah 42, where you find masculine and feminine language mixed together, it says, The Lord goes forth like a soldier. Like a warrior, he stirs up his fury. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. So here God is imaged both as a tough warrior and as a woman giving birth in the very same passage. One more example of this where you find these in such close proximity. Isaiah 46, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from your birth carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he. Even when you turn gray, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. It's fascinating to me how these biblical authors, Moses, Isaiah, and many others, have no problem at all just mixing their metaphors, masculine and feminine, all in one passage like this. Now, there are about, we're not going to, by the way, we're not looking at all the different passages today where God is referred to in maternal ways. One scholar has uh, estimated there's about 30 such passages. Today, we're just looking at a handful together that I think are, are representative. But sometimes we can easily overlook some of these passages because of translations. Sometimes some translations don't fully capture the original maternal imagery. Let me give you one example of this from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 20. This is from the New Revised Standard Version. And by the way, I don't think I've ever said this, but any time in worship when we read the Scripture, we always use the New Revised Standard Version, unless I note otherwise. Uh, and this is what, how it's translated in this. Is a frame, my dear son, and by the way, a frame was just another name for Israel at that time. Is a frame, my dear son, is he the child I delight in? As often as I speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, I am deeply moved for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. Those words there, deeply moved and have mercy. When we read that, of course, that doesn't bring anything to mind that's feminine or maternal. Um, another very popular translation is the NIV. 
and it translates that phrase, therefore my heart yearns for him, I have great compassion for him. Again, not much maternal uh, is there. This is the King James Version. I do earnestly remember him still, therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. This is one of the reasons I don't use the King James Version in worship. Because it talks about God having troubled bowels, and that's just not an image you really want to have in your mind. But actually, this King James Version translation does start to get at a little more of a literal translation. Here is what many scholars say is the most literal way of translating this. Therefore, my womb trembles for him. I will surely have womb-like compassion on him, says the Lord. Those words at the bottom there are Hebrew words, the words that were originally used. And the, the Hebrew word for womb is rahem. And the, the Hebrew word for compassion is arachemenu. Okay? They come from the same root word. The word for compassion that's used throughout the Old Testament has the same root word as the word for womb, which is very fascinating. When these ancient Israelites were trying to come up with a word, an image, that they thought could capture something about how God relates to people, the image that they came up with was the way a mother relates to a child in her womb. Because just as a child in the womb is being surrounded with nurture and love and care, so we from our very beginning are surrounded by God's love and care and compassion. Anytime in the Old Testament you see the word compassion, this is the image that's at the root of it. The way a mother relates to the child in her womb. So this is one example, and there are you know, many, many places in the scripture where it talks about this womb-like compassion. Let me give you another example that often doesn't come across in most translations. In the Old Testament, God is referred to 48 times as God Almighty. It's one of the most uh, kind of popular ways of referring to God, God Almighty. It comes from the Hebrew phrase El Shaddai. And for those of you into Christian music, you may remember, and I think it was the 90s, Amy Grant sang a song called El Shaddai and made this uh, uh, popular. El Shaddai. The interesting thing is no one knows for sure what El Shaddai really means. That's the most honest way of putting it. Uh, the word El means God. The debate is, what does Shaddai mean? And here's what most scholars have gone with. In the Hebrew language, the word for mountains is Sadu. So what many have taken this to say is that it's saying God of the mountains. And then from God of the mountains, they infer from that that by mountains, well, that's a symbol of strength and stability. And so it's talking about God's power. So God Almighty. Interesting. You can already see how much interpretation there is in that, to go from, well, it must be mountains, and then go from mountains to all-powerful. Here is another proposal you don't see very often. And by the way, just so you know I'm not making this up, if you were to look in virtually any study Bible that has little footnotes that tell you things about the verses, almost every study Bible I've looked at says the meaning of the Hebrew here is uncertain. They don't go into what it could mean. They just say it's uncertain. But here's what some scholars propose. The Hebrew word for breasts is shadu. Interesting. This could be translated just as well, God of the breasts. I'd like to see that on a flannel graph in Sunday school. You remember the flannel graphs? You don't have flannel graphs? Does anybody, have, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some people do. Thank you. Yes. I won't explain it. But anyways. So you could take it as God of the breasts, and from that... You could translate it as the mother God. That's how I got the title for today's sermon, by the way. This translation often isn't used, but it's, in my mind, just as legitimate as God Almighty. It could be the mother God. Now, one of the things that supports this translation is that in the book of Genesis, five out of the six times it's used, it's connected directly to female fertility. For example, Genesis 49, 25. By the God of your Father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. It's one of the ways that many scholars have argued that it was originally meant to be a maternal image of what God is like, a God who gives life and a God who nurtures. So interestingly enough, perhaps one of the ways to translate one of the most common names for God in the Old Testament is the mother God. Now, there are many other passages where this kind of imagery is used much more explicitly. So, for example, Job 38. The Lord says this, Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick dar darkness its swaddling band? 
and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no further, and here you shall hear your proud waves be stopped. So here we have God describing creation as an act of giving birth, as the waters coming forth from the womb of God. You find several passages like this in the Old Testament of creation described as coming forth from the womb of God. I think this is such a beautiful psalm. Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, my soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. A couple of background pieces here. This has a, kind of a subtitle here, A Song of Ascents of David. To say that it was of David did not mean that David wrote it. There are many psalms that say of David, but they were written much, much later uh, in honor of David or in tribute to him, but not written by him. In fact, this is one of the very few biblical passages that most scholars think a woman actually wrote. There are very few passages in the Bible that were written by women. This is, in all probability, one of them. It's a song of ascent because it would have been memorized and sung as people were making a pilgrimage to Mount Zion, to the temple. It's a song of ascent because they literally had to ascend Mount Zion when they would make a pilgrimage to go worship. And so Psalms 120 through 120, or, excuse me, 120 through 134 are the songs of ascents. They're short, and people memorized them and sang them on their way to worship. And so I, I can imagine here, you know, just a mother with her children walking, you know, making this long journey, and they stop and they rest, and she holds her child in her arms. And the child isn't wanting to nurse. The child isn't wanting anything from her. The child just wants to rest in her lap. And as she's sitting there holding her child, she thinks to herself, what a beautiful image for the way God relates to me. The way that she offers comfort to the child, the way it can just rest in her arms. So we too can rest in the arms of God in that way. That's why we can have hope in God, because God relates to us as a loving mother. I think this is one of the most beautiful psalms in, in, in all the scriptures. We have just looked at a handful of the ways that God is referred to as a mother. The ways in which mothers give us an image for what God is like. We haven't even really scratched the surface of the New Testament. Um, but there are many passages in the New Testament that point that way as well. Uh, for example, Jesus in Luke 15 describes God as a woman looking for her lost coin until she finds it. Jesus says that we must be born from above. Again, that's of course very, we don't often recognize it, but that's very maternal imagery. The God who gives us a new birth. All throughout the scriptures... God is in a, a myriad of ways imagined and, and talked about in feminine and maternal ways. But there are several uh, objections to this, this line of thinking. Um, in fact, I think there are whole organizations devoted <laughs> against this line of thinking. At least, you know, if you do a quick Google search on this, you can find whole organizations that seem to exist to talk about why it's wrong to refer to God as mother or with feminine language. And I'm just going to run through very briefly the four main objections. We just have a couple moments left. But one of the objections goes like this. Some people will say this. Well, in the Bible, you have masculine names for God, but feminine metaphors. In other words, God is addressed as father, as king. Those are masculine names. But when God is referred to in maternal ways or feminine ways, those are just figures of speech. To this objection, I would say you have underestimated how all of our language for God is metaphorical. It seems to me highly suspicious uh, that folks would take the masculine terminology as literal and then assume that the feminine terminology is metaphorical. There seems to me to be some sort of bias uh, at work there. All of our language for God is, of course, metaphorical. God isn't literally a man. God doesn't have a body, right? God is not gendered. Um, God is beyond. These are all metaphors. So I think this objection, making a distinction between names and metaphors, doesn't really hold much water. Now, for some people, there's just this jarring sense of, well, if I call God Father, how can God be both Father and Mother? Isn't that some sort of contradiction? Again, neither one is literal. I find it interesting that no one ever says, well, you can't call God both like a rock and like water, because rock is solid and water is not. No one says that. They're metaphors that in some ways point to God. 
And it's the same way with father imagery and with mother imagery. In some ways they connect with God and in some ways they do not. The second objection gets a little more particular. And many people point out, well, when Jesus taught us to pray, when he taught us to say the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to address God as our Father. And so in worship, whenever we say the Lord's Prayer, as we will in just a few moments before we take communion, we will address God as our Father. Now what many people do is they take from this then sort of the commandment or the injunction that we should only and always refer to God as Father. Two things I would say in response to that. The first thing is this. Jesus' earliest disciples did not understand him to mean this. In the book of Acts, we have recorded 11 prayers from Jesus' first disciples. Not one of them addresses God as Father. All of them address God as either God or Lord, or Lord of heaven and earth, something like that. So Jesus' first disciples didn't understand Jesus as saying literally, every time you pray, you have to say Father. It's not what he meant. I mean, if you take it that way, then why not just take it all the way and say the only words you can ever say are the Lord's Prayer? And that's not what Jesus intended. Of course, we can pray other words besides what's in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is meant to be a general guide or blueprint to shape our prayers. But it's not the only words that we can say. Now, the next objection is the most important one, and it refers to how we talk about the Trinity. And this is, to my mind, the most important objection to be raised here. There are many people in in church today who think that the traditional Trinitarian language is sexist, referring to God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so for decades now, there's been a movement um, to refer to God in a gender-neutral way, refer to the Trinity in a gender-neutral way. So one of the popular phrases that's caught on is referring to God instead of Father, Son, and Spirit as God as Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. I will just share with you, I could be wrong about this, I'd be willing to talk about it. I'm sharing with you my personal opinion. I'm not in favor of changing the traditional Trinitarian language. And I'm not saying, and I want to be very clear about this, I'm not saying that we need to eliminate, do away with, all masculine language for God. What I think we need to do is complement that language, supplement it with other feminine and maternal language as well. But when it comes to the Trinity, when it comes to naming the Trinity, especially in our central acts of worship, uh, so when, we, when I baptize somebody, uh, next week is Confirmation Sunday, and I'll be baptizing several folks, and I will baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yesterday when I married somebody, I consecrated their marriage in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think it's important to retain that traditional language for the Trinity for this reason. Not because God is a boy, but because the doctrine of the Trinity is rooted in Jesus' experience of God. And Jesus experienced God as his Father. And the reason Jesus experienced God as his Father is because God was his Father. You see, unlike any other human being, Jesus had God for his Father. Now, in a general way, yes, God is the Father and Mother of us all, but traditional Orthodox Christian thinking that holds that Jesus was born of a virgin, as I believe, holds that God was actually Jesus' Father. And Jesus experienced himself as the Son of God. In the ministry of Jesus, we see that Jesus promised then to send us the Holy Spirit, that he and his Father would come to us in the power of the Spirit. So for me, using the traditional Trinitarian language is kind of a shorthand way of saying, I believe this core Christian story, that God became incarnated in Jesus and then sent us the Spirit to be with us. So I'm not in favor of changing that language when we refer to the Trinity. I'm just in favor of doing a better job, and I know myself could do a better job, of using maternal and feminine language to talk about God as well. Now, one last objection. Those among us who are of a more conservative bent may hear this and think, well, this is just giving into a feminist agenda. You know, this is just a modern feminist agenda that's taking over the church. To that, I would just quickly say this. I have not made up any of these Bible verses. I would say this, that recovering feminine language for God is not about giving into a modern feminist agenda. It's about recovering an ancient biblical agenda. In the words of Brian Wren, a modern-day hymn writer and theologian, he says this, No image is adequate. To select one image and bow down to it is idolatrous. If we draw on a variety of God images and let them balance and rich and clash with one another, we shall be following the instincts of biblical faith and the methods of many biblical voices. I want to end today by doing something a little different. We, uh, uh, we're not in the service, but in the sermon. Um, I want to do a little responsive 
affirmation between us. And we're going to be using a song written by Brian Wren. It's called Many Names, Good and Beautiful. Uh, it's a very difficult hymn to sing, so we're not going to sing it, but it's very beautiful. The words, I think, are so powerful. So I'm going to read through each verse, and when we get to the last chorus line, the refrain, we're all going to say that together. Is that clear enough? Okay. Bring many names, beautiful and good. Celebrate in parable and story, holiness and glory, living, loving God. Hail and Hosanna, bring many names. Strong Mother God, working night and day, planning all the wonders of creation, setting each equation genius at play. Hail and Hosanna, strong Mother God. Warm Father God, hugging every child, feeling all the strains of human living, caring and forgiving till we're reconciled. Hail and Hosanna, warm Father God. Old aching God, gray with endless care, calmly piercing evil's new disguises, glad of good surprises, wiser than despair. Hail and Hosanna, old aching God. Young growing God, eager on the move, saying no to falsehood and unkindness, crying out for justice, giving all you have. Hail and Hosanna, young growing God. Great living God, never fully known, joyful darkness far beyond our seeing, closer yet than breathing, everlasting home. Hail and Hosanna, great living God. I invite you to pray with me. God above all names, we come to you through the name of Jesus. And we acknowledge that you carry each of us in your womb of compassion. You give birth to all that lives. And you sustain each of us with the spiritual milk of your grace and truth. On this day, God, in which we give thanks for mothers... We also pause to name and acknowledge the grief that accompanies many on this day. We pray for all those everywhere whose mothers were unable to love them, for all those whose mothers are no longer with them, for all those who struggle painfully with infertility. O oh God, like a mother, hold each of these persons close to your chest. Let them feel the warmth of your embrace and the heartbeat of your love. As a mother feeds her children, we pray, O oh God, that you would feed us as we come to your table. Feed us with the love poured out on the hard wood of the cross, with the love that rolled back the stone. Feed us with the joy of knowing that even though you reign infinitely above us, you long to dwell intimately within us. We ask these things through the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, and he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And with the boldness of children, let us weave our voices together in praying as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the servers to come forward at this time. And after we have taken our place, everyone is invited to come and feast on the grace of Jesus Christ. I'm 
ask for words And the funny thing is It's okay The last thing I need Is to be heard But to hear What you would say Word of God speak What you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak In the midst of you Beyond the music Beyond the noise And all that I need Is to be with you And in the quiet To hear your voice Word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of God speak My life has led me down the road that's so uncertain. Now I am left alone and I am broken, trying to find my way, trying to find the faith that's gone. This time. Know that you are holding all the answers And I'm tired of losing hope and taking chances All roads that never seem To be the ones that bring me home Give me a revelation Show me what to do Cause I've been trying to find my way I haven't got a clue Tell me should I stay here Or do I need to move Give me a revelation I've got nothing without you I've got nothing without you My life Lead me down this path that's ever winding Through every twist and turn I'm always finding That I am lost again Tell me when this road will ever end Give me a revelation Show me what to do Cause I've been trying to find my way I haven't got a clue Tell me should I stay here Do 
do I need to move? Give me a revelation. I've got nothing without you. I've got nothing without. I don't know where I can turn. Tell me when will I learn? Won't you show me where I need to go? know that it's the only way that I can get back home. Give me a revelation. Show me what to do. Cause I've been trying to find my way. I haven't got a clue. Tell me should I stay here or do I need to move? Give me a revelation. I've got stand as we sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever. Sing praise. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. Forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. Before 
I give the benediction, I just want to let you know, for all the ladies here, we have a gift of a, a pink carnation for you. We have ushers at all the, the exits, and so we invite all the ladies here on your way out to take one of those, just as a small token of our love and appreciation for you. Well, I invite you to go forth with this benediction. The God above all names has called you by name to follow Jesus and loving God and neighbor with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So go in peace to be the children of God. Let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God